Great. So our, our next speaker is Hatem Altaif uh, from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, and just a, a brief bio of Hatem. He's a principal research scientist in the Extreme Computing Research Center at CalST, uh, where he advises uh, several postdocs and students. Uh, he's been collaborating with domain scientists, including astronomers, statisticians, computational chemists, and geophysicists to equip their applications to meet the opportunities of exascale, which we're hopefully almost at. Uh, uh, he is author or co-authored over 100 publications in computational science engineering, numerical analysis, and computer science. And today he'll be talking about low ranks, low rank matrix approximations for HPC applications on Fujitsu's A64FX architecture. Thanks for joining hey. us. Hey, Jeff. Uh, can you see me and hear me? And yes. The slides? Yes. Okay. You have a awesome. very, very nice background. And, uh, uh, and we can see your slides. OK. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure for me to, to be here today and, and talk about some of the work we've been conducting on, the, on this uh, Fujitsu A64FX architecture. Uh, uh, so my, my, my talk has strong flavor on application, building up from uh, linear algebra uh, novel algorithm, if you will, and implementation, uh, and try to uh, uh, you know, leverage performance uh, on, on the Fujitsu A64FX architecture. We'll be looking at three uh, different applications, but it turns out that they have some, uh, you know, they share some common blocks that uh, we are, of course, trying to exploit, uh, uh, sort of uh, in a in an approach where we have one stone, multiple bird, and hopefully we'll uh, understand more as I uh, go with my slides. So uh, I'd like to uh, first thank um, thanks my collaborator in our center, the Extreme Computing Research Center, our astronomers, uh, you know, from Paris Observatory and uh, Australian National University, uh, also some CFD expert in France, uh, Min Paris Tech, Youssef Messri, um, colleague from the Supercomputing Lab at KAUST, uh, as well as uh, Fabrice Dupro from ARM and um, uh, Takayuki Yoshia from Fujitsu. Right, and I hope I forgot nobody. All right, so uh, the way we, we try to work in our center is that uh, we look at the hourglass and we revisit it. We have many applications, uh, and this is really something uh, really interesting about KAUS. We have this nice ecosystem with uh, many faculty members, most of them being uh, uh, you know, using uh, Shaheen or supercomputer in their daily basis. So this helps a lot for us in trying to investigate and assess uh, their current performance experience on the system and try to identify uh, rooms for improvement. Um, so some of those apps, they all have some common infrastructure, it can be just basically BLAS. Uh, we heard about BLAS, for instance, today a lot. Um, and, uh, and then we try to map it to various architectures. So if you are able to express your application using algorithm that rely on BLAS, for instance, then all of a sudden you can really have access to many architecture. Okay, and this is really the uh, sort of the, uh, you know, approach we are undertaking here uh, and try to, uh, you know, impact as many application uh, as possible. Um, so the first one, right, this first application is uh, trying to reveal, uh, you know, revealing the underground layers with seismic yeah. emerging. Um, so uh, seismic emerging is important. Uh, for oil and gas, of course, but we're trying to uh, move away from uh, uh, the, uh, if you will, the, uh, you know, the carbon industry. I mean, we still need it, but uh, for obvious reason, we, we try to use uh, seismic imaging in other, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy technologies. Um, and, and for that, we require even higher level of details. Uh, I've seen also recently uh, uh, that uh, it can be uh, used, seismic imaging for monitoring the permafrost degradation. So this is actually very interesting for uh, environmental uh, reasons. And the approach is uh, this uh, technique called seismic redatuming. Uh, the idea consists in placing, um, after you do sort of a land survey, for instance, trying to see what's happening uh, underground, uh, you know, some of your uh, receivers that you have placed, uh, you know, in your, in your uh, area of your land of interest, um, you know, may not be placed properly. So the seismic redatuming allows to uh, uh, you know, put those receivers in uh, area of interest uh, after you've done the land survey without having to do a land survey. So that is a huge benefit in terms of cost and in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, time, obviously, uh, by reusing uh, and, and post-processing the data that you have already collected via the land survey. So this is, uh, think of it as a post-processing to seismic emerging. 
uh, trying to understand what's happening uh, under, you know, underground. The second application is uh, outsmarting the atmospheric turbulence in adaptive optics. This is computational astronomy. I actually described this one uh, in my last uh, uh, um, HVC user group back at ASC. We have latest results that I'll be sharing. Uh, but you know, the interesting thing here is that you know the work that we've done in astronomy, we were able to use it, uh, you know, almost out of the box by changing the precision and actually playing with the real data set for uh, the application that I just talked about, uh, the seismic imaging. Uh, so going back to this apps here, um, you know, atmospheric turbulence. Uh, this is basically providing real time simulation. Or, uh, you know, by uh, accelerating uh, some of the core linear algebra uh, operation required by all those ground based telescopes. And this is where I really uh, I love it a lot because, you know, uh, this is really a, a main uh, kernel, which is, uh, you know, the common denominator for all of those, uh, you know, ground based telescopes. And the idea is to provide them a capability of, uh, you know, outsmarting the atmospheric turbulence so that they can see uh, as if their telescope was placed like in Hubble in space without having to deal with the uh, atmospheric turbulence. So the, there is a huge, uh, you know, uh, constraint in terms of, uh, you know, real time, in terms of computation, uh, complexity, uh, energy. Those telescopes are all located in location that, you know, they can't afford to have a power plant running just next to their telescope. So, the, you know, energy is also, uh, you know, a concern for them. All right. So the third application has yet again nothing to do with the two others. Uh, this 3D unstructured mesh deformation. We uh, teamed up, uh, you know, last year with a colleague of us in CFD from France, Youssef Misri. The idea was to model the 3D mesh deformation on the population of the novel coronavirus. The idea is that we look at a bunch of uh, those viruses put together, uh, build up from, uh, you know, their meshes, their molecular structure. Uh, looking at the spike and eventually uh, the virus with many spikes and then the population of uh, those viruses put together, packed together and try to understand uh, how they interact to each other and how this impact their contour, their surface and how they deform basically uh, if you were to do uh, a time integration for instance. And we are basically trying to accelerate here the calculation of this mesh deformation that involves solving a dense uh, problem um, which uh, we try to, uh, you know, uh, accelerate uh, algorithmically first, and then having a, a good uh, implementation for it. All right. So there are three applications here. Uh, again, uh, we have uh, seismic imaging, computational astronomy, and uh, CFD, unstructured mesh deformation. The first two they share the same kernel, and this is the one that I'm be talking about, uh, you know, in the next few slides. All right. And you know, given the, the, the broad aspect of application, we really adopt an approach based on separation of concern. So we do collaborate with experts in dynamic runtime system, obviously in domain science as well with those three applications that I mentioned. And we are looking at the advanced numerical algorithm. So really this three uh, sort of pillar together uh, makes it happen and, and deliver a nice synergies that we have uh, seen uh, uh, this year and, and the previous years. Um, so the common, theme here about those three applications is that they all involve matrices, okay? Uh, at the end of the day, they all involve matrices and they wanna do operation on those. The catch here is that we are trying to exploit the data sparsity of these matrices. All these matrices are dense. They all come to us and they have a dense format, but uh, they are uh, actually not dense. They, are, uh, they have sparsity in the data, right? So what it means is that you could, uh, you know, compress those matrices uh, and only retain the most important information. And with that most important information, you then have to develop your algorithm that will run on top of that compressed data structure, compressed data structure. And, and that's what uh, you know, I'll be really uh, you know, discussing in, in, those, uh, in those slides. Uh, what we do, we use HECMA, our library called HECMA, Hierarchical Computation on Many Core Architecture. And, and uh, we basically uh, are trying to uh, compress the matrix retain only the most significant information. This translates into not only reducing the uh, arithmetic complexity, but also um, uh, you know, the, uh, the memory footprint, right? So since we compress, we store less uh, data information, and then we operate on less data, which uh, of course then uh, improve the overall time to solution. This compression that we do, you know, this is an approximation, right? So we introducing an error, 
right? We're introducing an error to uh, those uh, applications. And I can tell you really domain scientists, they are not that happy when you start playing with, uh, you know, their accuracy, right? They are used to, you know, 64-bit uh, for some of them, you know, 32-bit for some of them. And then you come and telling them, hey, listen, you have this matrix, but, you know, it has redundant information. You can compress it up to a certain threshold. And then guess what? At the end, you know, I promise you will get your accuracy. Uh, it was, you know, we had really tough discussion actually with some of those uh, domain scientists, but then, you know, we proved them that indeed it does not, uh, you know, um, it does not uh, uh, create or it does not uh, deteriorate, uh, you know, their overall accuracy budget. And that's key, of course, for them to, to maintain, you know, the uh, qualitative, uh, you know, uh, metric of their application. Uh, so what we do, uh, again, we have a dense matrix, right? That dense matrix, we tile it into blocks, right, into tiles. And we approximate each of those tiles individually up to a certain accuracy threshold. We can compress it in various approaches, various algorithms. Uh, we typically use SVD for optimality, but there are many, uh, you know, sampling approaches based on, on randomized approach to, to do that efficiently. But here, the take home message really of the slide is that we have a dense matrix. We split it into tiles. Each of those tiles, we compress it. We keep the most important information. And then from there, start a new, uh, a new phase. How can I run my algorithm that used to run on, on flat, dense data structure? How can it run on a compressed format? Okay. Uh, so before I move uh, and explain this uh, further, uh, I'd like to uh, show you, indeed, you can really exploit this data sparsity in those matrices. Those are the matrices that we get from real data sets from, uh, you know, seismic emerging. Okay. And uh, basically on the left side, this is a heat map of the ranks. So the ranks is the basically uh, the number of singular values and associated singular vectors that are the most important to keep, okay? And here, what it means is that if the matrix, uh, if the color, I mean, uh, uh, the blue color means that uh, the ranks are really small. The red color means that the ranks are high and you, know, you need to keep those information. And initially, when you look at the matrix, it's a dense matrix. You don't have zeros there, right? You have really non-zeros elements. And when you, when you compress it, you find out that the ranks actually are really high around the diagonal and elsewhere, you don't have much information to uh, really, uh, you know, uh, to, to play with, right? So uh, by doing this compression upfront, you can then really uh, optimize, you know, and you know, optimize your time to solution and, and improve uh, your performance. And on the uh, on the right side here, I look at the rank distribution, and as you can see, ranks are actually, uh, you know, very uh, uh, disparate, right? So we have uh, tiles with high ranks, tiles with low ranks. Uh, and then, you know, uh, clearly this is an indication that we're going to have to deal with load imbalance here, right? Because some tiles convey lots of information, mean, this means lots of work. And some of the tiles, they don't convey much after all. And, you know, they may have just uh, low ranks and uh, they still need to be considered. Uh, and, and, and this, of course, introduce, again, load imbalance. This is for seismic uh, imaging. Uh, for, uh, you know, for the Mavis instrument, this is an instrument that we, will be deployed on the very large telescope. Um, you know, we do the same thing, the same story. We have the matrix, we apply to it an X-ray, if you will, and we try to reveal the most important information. Black and red, as you can see in this rank heat map, black and red indicate that ranks are small. So this means you can compress. So this means, you know, the, the matrix that is dense initially, you can actually compress it and then do things on it. And that's what uh, we show here on the rank, uh, you know, again, distribution. And most of the ranks actually, uh, you know, are small, are rather small compared to the tile size. And they are also, again, disparate, load imbalance. Okay, so same challenge that we've seen for seismic imaging, we're gonna see it also for uh, computational uh, astronomy application. And those two applications here, the common denominator is that the operation that I'm gonna do once I compress my matrix is an MVM, matrix vector multiplication. That's what they do, uh, you know, uh, day and night, million times actually per night of observation. Uh, they compute and they have to be computed in, you know, as fast as possible so that they don't have, or they don't introduce a lag, you know, in observing uh, the light that come from remote stars. And here I'm showing you a cartoon roughly how this works. Uh, you know, I believe I showed some of the slide in my previous uh, ARM HPC user group talk, but, uh, you know, I think it's important to revive it here. So we have a dense matrix, I'm gonna do a MVM matrix vector multiplication and get my uh, solution vectors. That solution vector, for instance, uh, is critical for, in astronomy, it will tell how those tiny mirror located on the telescope, how they should tilt uh, one way or another, uh, you know, to compensate for the turbulence. 
All right, so I have a dense matrix. What I do, as I said, I compress each of those tiles. Each of those tiles of my dense matrix, I compress them and retain only the most significant information. So that's my first step, I compress, okay? Once I compress, then I can do my uh, MVM operation. And before I do that, I do a cool thing here. I, I stack my bases, this U and V bases that describe you know, the tile, each of those tiles. You know, I, I, I stack them in memory so that I have a nice contiguous uh, access, memory access, right? And here for simplicity, of course, I took the ranks to be similar, right? I assume that each of those tiles has the same uh, you know, number or you know, number of singular values that is important to keep, to maintain, so that I can get my good accuracy. And for simplicity, again, purposes, uh, I keep, I, I assume I have a constant rank across all types. Which is of course not the case, as I showed in the previous uh, rank heat maps. I have you know variation of the ranks, and that's really a challenge to deal with. All right. So once I've done my, uh, I stack the bases. I can do then my operation, which is really an MVM. To do that, I start taking my V bases, and I have to apply a batch matrix vector multiplication, uh, touching uh, you know the V bases structure uh, with the corresponding X vector. When I do that, I get a transient data called YV. That's a transient, uh, you know, data structure uh, that contain the intermediate result uh, because I'm not done yet, right? I just played with the U uh, with the V basis. I still have the U basis to do that. So in, in the second phase, what I do, I take my YV uh, intermediate structure and I sort of uh, project it into the U basis, right? Basis that could be then, uh, uh, you know, multiplied in the last phase uh, by the corresponding U basis, all right? So. And here again, I have a batch matrix vector multiplication. And at the end, I get my final result Y, okay? So I do this uh, Tyler rank MVM, and it has three phases, uh, mostly uh, involving, uh, you know, memory bound operation. And, uh, you know, this is batch matrix vector multiplication. Here, I showed it with constant ranks, but of course it's with variable ranks. And this is uh, really challenging. All right, okay. So this is the architecture that we need to play with, right? The A64FX, uh, you know, we need to have an implementation that is architecture aware with those, uh, you know, core memory group uh, that we have on a single node of uh, uh, Fujitsu A64FX. And we need to apply also load balancing optimization here. And we rely on OpenMP uh, strategies to do that, to accomplish uh, this uh, load balancing. Um, and um, so that's, uh, that's uh, what it is for the implementation. When we talk about approximation, I want you to have faith in, in the error that I introduced, uh, making sure we do deliver the right accuracy as if we didn't do any approximation. We do lose a bit, but this does not again impact the uh, you know, uh, quality, uh, the qualitative result. And here what I'm show, uh, showing is the impact of the accuracy threshold and the tile size for this matrix vector multiplication. And I look at the SNR, the, SNR, uh, the signal to noise ratio, uh, for uh, seismic, uh, uh, the seismic emerging application. And typically uh, 10, uh, 10 to the power minus three uh, accuracy threshold and a tile size of 256 will give me a, a proper, uh, you know, signal ratio, uh, a blue signal, um, uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, you know, uh, a, a blue color. So this means it's good, the higher, the better. And the number that you see there is the number of operation that I'll be saving purely from, uh, an, you know, an algorithmic point of view. All right, so that's the speed up I should get simply by looking at how many operation I would do if I were to do the thing in dense or if I were to do the thing in approximated way. That is almost a 4x performance uh, you know, speed up by doing that. This is for seismic application. Uh, and we here look at uh, the impact on the image, right? Uh, and look at various approximation and how this impact the, um, the, 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 those frequencies. And indeed uh, for 10 to the power minus uh, three, this is a good um, you know, compression error uh, because when you look at the uh, uh, error that we introduce, it, it's, it's negligible compared to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to the uh, overall um, you know, uh, MVM uh, when we do it in dense. All right, so that's the seismic. Now we look at the uh, uh, computational astronomy application. Same story, we are trying to assess again the error that we introduce. We have another metric, uh, qualitative metric for astronomy, which is called the uh, stray ratio. Uh, this uh, uh, this is a metric that tells about the uh, that measure the quality of the optical image obtained at the end uh, from the telescope. And here, what we can see is that 
typically a, a tile size of 128 and an accuracy threshold of 10 to the power minus four will deliver the proper you know, uh, stray ratio. And again, there is a save around you know, three to four X in terms of flops, right? So that's, uh, that's very interesting uh, to, to be able really to identify uh, such uh, you know, characteristic in those operator uh, from those few applications. Performance. Now I'm moving to performance, seismic or day tuning. Uh, I'm looking at the left side and uh, you know, I have two figures where I report the time. So the lower, the better. And on the right side, I'm reporting the bandwidth, uh, the higher, the better. So on the left side, I can, you know, we apply various strategies to improve, uh, you know, the performance uh, uh, with uh, some OpenMP, you know, pragmas and, and some merging phases and also what we call zigzag mapping to uh, alleviate or mitigate the, um, you know, load imbalance overhead. On the right side, this is the bandwidth observed uh, when we do that for each of those various optimization. And we are, uh, you know, we're comparing against the uh, dense MVM. Of course, the dense MVM is very regular and hits very close to the peak bandwidth. Uh, our best optimization uh, gets closer to it. But in terms of time, there is a huge, of course, performance benefit in, in doing low rank approximation. Uh, we scale up, right? We, we run now on up to 16 nodes on a system that uh, um, uh, Takayuki from Fujitsu uh, was uh, uh, nice enough to give us remote access. And we can see that we have a, a decent scalability and we have actually a, a very nice performance speed up compared to uh, if you were to do the thing in dance. Um, I think I'm still having five minutes if I'm not mistaken. Um, all right, so this was the performance on seismic day to me. Now we look at the astronomy, right? We report bandwidth. Okay, so I'm gonna spend one minute here on this slide because you know I think it's very interesting and I'd like to convey a few messages here. Uh, so we're looking at various architecture, right? We play with the various style sizes. Those style sizes are mostly uh, performance tunable parameter, right? So this really, it's a trade-off between how much concurrency you want to expose uh, to your hardware. And on the y-axis is sustained bandwidth. So the higher, the better. And I'm putting here a mixture of, you know, GPUs, x86, uh, you know, vector, uh, vector machine, uh, AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, uh, and of course, our A64FX, right? So we can see that uh, we do score with A64FX, then we're very close to HBM, uh, you know, uh, GPUs, GPU-based, uh, I mean, HBM, right? So am I, uh, you know, 100, V100, uh, you know, Aurora to some extent, and 800 as well. So the cool thing about A64FX is you can really play with HBM without having to deal with moving data to the GPU, for instance. And that's a, a very interesting thing, right? Uh, although Aurora, you can run it, uh, you know, uh, directly uh, on, on a, na a native, uh, you know, approach, but, you know, compared to the GPUs, other GPUs, you know, the A64FX, the advantage is you can really leverage HBM without having to deal uh, with this data motion uh, between uh, CPU and GPU. However, uh, what we've seen here on, uh, on the ROM, uh, Epic ROM, AMD, we, we are able to, because we compress, the data structure is much smaller. It does fit in L3. And there is a huge performance benefit, right, on, on, on running on AMD ROM. And that's really, was really interesting for us to see that. And there are many reasons for this, and I would uh, invite you to look at the uh, paper for, for, to, for an explanation. But the point here is that ROM will get a high performance is because L3, the last level cache, is rather large. Is actually pretty large, right? So we decouple from main memory, from DRAM, and we run at uh, LLC speed. I wish on A64FX, we had a larger L3 cache, right? Because then we have the, the benefit of the, you know, the, the two best world. We're getting access to HBM, right? And we're getting a L3 boost because we have, uh, uh, you know, a higher capacity than what we have before. So, you know, what I would really like to see on future, perhaps, uh, you know, Fujitsu architecture, to have really larger LLC to, to, to see a huge benefit here. All right, my last application, if you recall it, it was about CFD, unstructured mesh deformation. Uh, and, and here we're doing uh, a really uh, challenging matrix operation, much, much more challenging than an MVM, than a matrix vector multiplication. We're solving here a linear system, right? We're factorizing and we're solving a linear system. We're looking at various interpolation matrix uh, to generate uh, our operator. Uh, and you know, it turns out that the Gaussian one, right? This, those are heat maps before and after factorization. It turns out when we approximate our operator with the Gaussian with this accuracy, right? 
I not only get uh, uh, you know the proper accuracy at the end for my solver, but I also have a much smaller time to solution. So that's the one that we're gonna select. The problem with this one is the following, right? This is heat map. So when you see white, it means a zero, okay? And um, you know when I do factorization, there are some fill in at the end. And you know the problem is when I generate my operator, it is dense, right? It is really dense, and that's a uh, uh, that, that's something that I only know that, I mean, I only know afterwards when I compress that my matrix is actually not dense anymore, but it's actually sparse. It's a mixture of sparse and dense and low rank, you know, structure, right? And this is very challenging to code by our hand. And if you recall our separation of concern approach, we rely on runtime system to, uh, to basically uh, play with those data structure on our behalf to properly, um, you know, move data around uh, you know, a dense data or low rank data structure, uh, you know, across the network, you know, for us. We just build the kernels and we rely on, on actually, you know, here, this is Parsec, one time system to do the job for us. Uh, the thing is this, when I do, uh, when I generate the dense matrix, uh, you know, uh, Parsec think it's a dense matrix and I'm about to do, let's say, a Cholesky factorization on it. So he starts looking at various data dependencies, but it turns out that those data dependencies should not exist. Initially, the matrix is dense, and uh, Parsec gets that inside. But after compression, you know, I have white, you know, I have those holes there, right? And this means I don't need to communicate anymore with that. So I used to have a DAG that is dense, but now I need to trim it. And when you trim it, you of course cut down data motion, you cut down, uh, you change your execution flow, you change your critical path, and many other things change. You actually even introduce load imbalance, right? So the first optimization we do is we remove some of those. Uh, extra additional uh, data dependencies that should not be there. Uh, and then what we do, we rely on the usual 2D block cyclic data distribution and uh, you know, to balance the workload when the matrix is dense, but the matrix is not dense anymore. The matrix is actually really, it's, it's sparse and data sparse, right? So the 2D block cyclic data distribution that is used in scale pack and, and, and for dense solver does not work here anymore. So we introduce uh, a hybrid uh, you know, distribution uh, to mitigate uh, the work happening in the diagonal that is really dense and computer intensive, and the work that happens off diagonal that uh, is mostly uh, you know low rank work and uh, more uh, toward memory bound type, type of workload. And what we in addition do to reduce communication, we increase the band uh, because it turns out that the ranks close to the diagonal are also high, and I rather have uh, these files belonging to the same node or MPI process to uh, you know, uh, favor a shared memory data movement, right? Over, you know, a data movement across the network, which are more expensive. And what we, uh, last thing that we do, we put uh, a diamond uh, structure to further mitigate the load imbalance, right? Between the work that happens around the diagonal and the work that happens off diagonal, okay? So there are few optimizations that we applied and this is the performance we get on Fugaku, okay? This is, those are actually, uh, uh, recent results that are not published yet. And uh, I'm reporting time to solution, looking at matrices up to 12 million. This is 512 nodes. You would never be able to store 12 million matrix, dense matrix on 512 node of Fugaku. We are able to solve it here because we compress, right? Again, I wanna insist on that, uh, or emphasize on this, uh, on this thing. Uh, so here we look at the performance impact of various optimization that I talked about. Uh, removing uh, the extra data dependencies that we have in our DAG because the matrix turns out to be more sparse than dense and then reducing communication playing with various data distribution, uh, mitigating, uh, mitigating the load, uh, you know, load balancing or load imbalance overhead um, by again playing uh, with the data distribution. And you know, critical path here is the time that you would do as if you didn't have any work outside of your, uh, you know, uh, diagonal, right? So um, this is basically your lower bound, okay? Um, this is the maximum that you can achieve. And uh, so I'm showing time, the lower, the better. And you can see uh, each time I enable, uh, you know, some optimization, I'm able to get really close to uh, the optimal that I could get. Um, and I think I'm done with that. I'll be happy to take any question. I hope I'm on time. Great. Uh, yeah, I think we have time maybe for 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 one one quick question. Anyone has uh, any? Yeah. 
Maybe me, Eric speaking. So uh, really Hi, impressive uh, work at them. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's good to see that uh, application of low rank and how it could help to improve performance, minimize the memory footprint. Uh, so as you uh, quoted Theo Marie in your uh, presentation, just yeah. wonder if you were able to, uh, let's say, uh, to benchmark some of your uh, uh, solvers with the MIMS uh, to, to, to get comparison. Yeah, so, uh, you know, so MIMS is a Spark Direct solver, right? Uh, so, yeah. uh, meaning, uh, you know, they will do, uh, you know, block low rank, approach when uh you know they uh, basically uh traverse uh this multifrontal tree uh, from bottom up and they would apply um you know blr uh, you know in the short complement okay so our our, our approach is a, is a bit different we have a dense direct solver right so initially our matrix is dense it's not sparse right mm -hmm. so um so it, it's it, it's a bit it's actually quite difficult to really compare with what they do right uh, uh, so, I mean, the idea is the same, right? The idea is really the same, uh, you know, but, you know, the, the context where we apply that idea is different. And I think it's uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, except if we, we really get uh, uh, an expert in MUMS to extract, uh, you know, only that factorization and try to apply it, uh, you know, on our side, uh, uh, you know, then maybe that comparison may be difficult. But I think initially it's really apple and oranges. We you know, we have to compress the whole matrix. It's a dense matrix. It's 12 million here in this case, 12 million by 12 million. We actually even went to, you know, almost 60 million by 60 million. Uh, and that's a, a matrix that is dense initially. And that's something that you won't encounter in the sparse, uh, you know, direct to, you know, direct solver, you know, uh, environment. Uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, what you, you know, uh, what you, what you asked. The it's just that I think the comparison is a bit, uh, is a bit off, is a bit difficult to do. Yeah, yeah, I saw that it was, uh, let's say, dance matrix. It was work for the last example with the diagonal. And, uh, that oh, it, very good. Oh, yeah. good yeah. Absolutely. So you write on it, okay? And actually, yeah. the conclusion of the paper that, uh, uh, you know, let me show it right here, right? Indeed, the matrix is sparse here, right? Initially, it's dense. Yeah. When we compress it, it turns out <laughs> to be really sparse. And uh, we actually uh, talking to uh, Pastix people as well. Uh, you know, they have some, uh, uh, you know, Ty Lorenko, you know, uh, uh, implementation of, of their uh, Spark Direct solver on shared memory only. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there is a nice actually here, uh, you know, takeover from, uh, you know, the Spark Direct solver once you compress it here, because indeed it's, it may be an overkill to solve this, uh, you know, such, uh, you know, such matrix uh, using dense direct solver. You rather use nested dissection here and, and really spark direct solver to expose further parallelism. That's a good point, Thierry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, again, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Are there, are there any other quick questions or? Uh, we may ask you to, to post in the chat or, or on Slack. You know, I think I think a lot of us are on there as well. Uh, thank you very much, Atom. So we'll, we'll move on to our last talk.